I know. That's because the microphone's not on. Here comes Kenny. He'll get it going for us. All right. Can you hear me now? All right. Good morning. Just a couple of announcements. The uh, Mission Sunday is today. Offering plate is in the back for our missionaries, Will and Jen Scott, and also for the uh, Shaw family. So if you uh, can give to that, that would be great. I know they appreciate it. I have a special announcement too. I'm give, we're giving you a heads up. As you uh, know, we have been praying uh, for Jamie Crable for some time, the son of uh, Jerry and Pam, who has uh, leukemia, and uh, he has. Uh, it's been a it's been a uh, real tough road, uh, and he is literally in a battle for his life. He has, they've come to a place in his treatment <clears throat> where he can have a bone marrow transplant. They found a couple of donors, and that is going to be uh, coming up soon. As we uh, were visiting on uh, Tuesday night at the council meeting, it was brought up that, that uh, we need to do a benefit for Jamie. He has uh, not been able to work. Uh, for some time or will not be able to for some time and uh, I'm sure that uh, he and Angie could receive uh, uh, some support and uh, we're his church family he's a young man who was raised in this church and uh, I think that uh, it's a great idea for us to do something special <clears throat> for Jamie so we're planning to do uh, and this is like the 20 it's in the end of April, 25th of April, somewhere around that. Uh, after Easter is when we want to have the event. We're going to do a dinner. Uh, we're going to do sushi. No, we're going to do uh, uh, Chinese. Uh, no, I, we're going to do uh, spaghetti or chili or something. I don't think that's been fully uh, ironed out yet. Uh, but we want to do an auction. It'll be a combination probably of a silent auction and a regular auction. And so we're just giving you the heads up on this. We'd like you to begin to think about it, uh, what you might uh, want to contribute. I've already made up my mind and decided what I'm going to do uh, for the, uh, this event for Jamie. And uh, you'll be thinking about what uh, uh, you would like to do. Uh, somebody asked me in the early service, and I don't know who can answer this for me, but they asked if we're, if we're contributing all just brand new stuff, or can it be good used stuff? Is that, does anybody, can anybody answer that? It should probably be new stuff? Okay. Things that are, that are new, that, that have value for being auctioned. Okay, um, so that's the details, there we, will be more details as time goes on, but we wanted to plant that in your mind so that you could be thinking about that, and we're hoping it'll be a, a tremendous event, it's a great thing for us to do together, to work together to uh, accomplish something like this. All right, one other announcement. Coming up uh, on the 7th of March will be the uh, annual Ladies Brunch, the Four Seas Ladies Brunch. It will be in Mitchell at the Federated Church this year. And there is a sign-up sheet in the Narthex. And those need to be in by the 2nd of March. So uh, you can sign up. This is for everybody, for all the ladies, all the late ladies from all the churches they get together and have a wonderful time of uh, fellowship. It'll be a great program, and uh, it's just a good thing for the ladies to do, and, and I know that they all enjoy it whenever they get together. Okay.
Okay, let's have uh, Brother Kenny come and uh, give us our scripture reading this morning. Okay, if you'd open your hymnals to number 725, 725. And I will read the light print and you read the dark. It is titled Revival and Renewal. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, we are a chosen people and pray and seek my face, we are a royal priesthood, and turn from their wicked ways, we are a wicked holy nation. Then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. We have sinned, we have done wrong. <clears throat> Restore us, O God, make your face shine upon us, that we may be saved. Now, if you'd all please stand, we're going to sing Revive Us again, number 719. Fellowship. 
We pray, Father, that we will use the uh, what we receive wisely and it will bless others for your kingdom. So we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
You may be seated. As we uh, go to the Lord in prayer today, I want to uh, just give you an update on Jan. She's really pretty sick right now. Um, as you know, or maybe you don't know, uh, she has a condition called bronchioecstasis, and it's a condition where the uh, uh, lung sacs over a period of time lose their ability to function, the elasticity, they kind of swell and then they don't. They don't force air out and pump anymore like your lungs do. And as a result, then it uh, is easy for mucus and all to, to collect there and not uh, come out, and then it gets infected. And it's the constant, uh, uh, about, constant battle. It's why she has to do her nebulizing treatment several times a day uh, to keep those airways open and uh, a lot of coughing and, and all. And it's just kind of gotten the better of her the last uh, couple of weeks. And uh, we went and saw the pulmonary doctor. There's a new pulmonary doctor here called Dr. Abadala. Uh, I said that quite well because uh, I, I think of our dollar. So it's our dollar, it's Abadala. Uh, and uh, she had been under the care of uh, Brooke Borgman who is, a, I believe, a nurse practitioner uh, for some time, and she was just excellent uh, in pulmonary. She's just terrific. Uh, but she left the uh, pulmonary department to go work full-time at urgent care. So uh, that was a real disappointment to us because she had been really taking good care of Jan. So we were a little apprehensive about what was going to happen because we, frankly, haven't had a a lot of good success with pulmonary doctors here. But we met Dr. Awadala and he really impressed us. He, he was right on target with her. He knew, understood her condition and uh, was uh, just, just seemed to really be uh, um, wanting to really uh, work with her and help her. So he did a culture that revealed that she has two bacteria that are in her lungs, and that's what we have to do that once in a while to, to see. And the antibiotics that she was using were not being effective on those, so she is having to do this uh, inhaled uh, uh, antibiotic, and it's uh, it's a real rough treatment. She does it twice a day, and it makes her cough and gag, and it's it's, it's not a fun treatment to do but it's probably the only thing that's going to get those bacteria that are there. She has to do that 28 days, um, so she's not going to be here uh, for a while uh, and has to be real careful about where she goes. I will take her out once in a while for a ride just so she can get out of the house and, you know, she can go see a little bit different scenery. I'm sure she gets tired of looking at me all the time. Uh, but. Uh, that's where she's at, so I would appreciate it if we'd add her to the prayer list and you keep her on in your prayers throughout the week. And Bob File is uh, home from the hospital and uh, he had a, he had a uh, valve replacement and I think maybe a bypass or two. And uh, he's recuperating, going to take some time, but uh, he's doing well, so we're thankful for that. Let's pray. Father, what a blessing it is for us to be part of your family. We go through difficulties and trials in life, and we know, Father, that, that uh, you never told us that life would be easy, but you did tell us and promised us that you would be with us. And we claim that today, and we thank you for your presence in our life, in uh, all, that we, <clears throat> all that we do. And we want to acknowledge that. We want to, we want to live for you, Father. We want our lives to, we want our lives to become more and more like Jesus, and to to live the kind of life that you created us to live, so that we can enjoy this wonderful fellowship that we have one with another and with you, and then of course the the wonderful hope of heaven uh, when we shall be together again with. Jesus and our loved ones and friends. 
And Father, today as we are here, we, we are grateful for your presence in the service. Thank you for the music that we've already enjoyed, the scripture reading. And we just ask that you will continue to speak to our hearts as the morning goes on. Father, we lift up those special needs that we have before you, and we bring Jan before you today, Lord, and we know that uh, she's probably, uh, right now, I'm sure she's probably reading her Bible or watching some uh, praise music or something, Lord, and we just pray that you will be with her and touch her and bless her and to bring a healing touch to her body, Father. You are the great physician, regardless of we, whether we use the wonderful science that mankind has been privileged to uh, to uh, discover or whether you do a direct touch by your spirit all healing comes from you and we thank you and give you praise for that we thank you for Bob Files uh, progress that he is making Lord just continue to to bring healing to his body we also lift up Don Fitz today that you'll touch him and Randy Meter, Lord, continue to bless his life. For Don Burns, Lord, in his continuing struggle, Lord, just touch him today. We pray, Father, today for Pastor Ted. We thank you that he is here today and just bless him and just encourage him, Father. And may he know that not only is he loved by you deeply, but he's loved by his church family. Father, we pray for Charlene today, that you will continue to work in her life as she needs a special touch. For shame, Lord, as he is going through his uh, physical ordeal, Lord, touch him. We lift up Jamie today as he's looking for this uh, moral tra uh, uh, bone moral transplant, Lord, that you will be with him and, and be with the doctors. And this, He's in a, a good place, probably one of the best medical facilities in, in the world where he's getting this treatment, Lord, and we just pray that you will continue to touch him and Help us as a church family, Lord, as we're looking to do something to, to uh, help him in a financial way, that we will be able to truly give an outpouring of, of our love to him. We pray, Father, for Walker, who's also con continuing in his uh, uh, treatment with leukemia. Touch him today. Lift up Yvonne today, Father, and touch her. And Jean Manka, Lord, this dear brother, just to touch him today and encourage him and strengthen him. Pray for Lucille today, a precious and dear lady. Lord, just touch her life. Father, we pray for our ministry outreaches of the church. We thank you for the wonderful time that the ladies had at their banquet, uh, Valentine's banquet this last week, and for the encouragement and inspiration that they uh, received there. We pray, Father, for Awana. This is such a, a great and wonderful program where we can touch the lives of children and their parents. And Father, we pray for them. We pray for the parents. We pray that you will be with them and help them, Father, to as they bring their children, that they too will be touched by the, by the gospel message of Jesus Christ and how we can change our lives and, and truly make us new in Christ. Father, we pray today that you'll be with our farmers and our ranchers. We lift them up to you and this harvest time is going on and we know they're making plans for the future. We just pray that you will guide them and lead them and bless their lives. We lift up our nation to you today, Father. We pray for our president and our vice president. We pray for the members of the House of Representatives, the members of the Senate. We pray for those who are working in the cabinet, the State Department, all of those, Father. We pray that there will be a move of your Holy Spirit within that group where people's lives will be changed and we'll truly, we'll, we'll truly learn how to live together and grow together and be a blessing to the world that you raised this great country up to be. We pray for our local community, Father, for our leaders in the, in the county and the city, our schools, teachers, administrators, students, Lord, bless their lives today. We pray, Father, for our first responders. We thank you for them. We pray right now, even as they are on duty, many of them, and but may be going to emergency situations, that you will keep them safe and bless them and help them as they help us. Father, we pray today that you'll be with our military men and women, protect their lives and keep them. Be with our, our the wounded warriors, Lord, whose lives have been so drastically changed because of their injuries. 
Bless them, bless their families, Lord. We also pray, Father, for our veterans. Thank you for them and thank you for their service to our wonderful country. And Father, today we want to pray for Israel. We just know, Father, that Israel is the focal point of all of human history. And Father, we just pray that you will be with them. And as you fulfill your will for this world, Father, we pray that you will keep them and, and that you will bring about your kingdom in this world. And together, Father, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. In Psalms 51, it says, Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Every heart here this morning needs the perfect and awesome changes that can only come by the power of our Creator. David realized this in Psalms, and he was asking God for forgiveness for what he had done wrong. God is the only one who can mold us and make us and make us more like Him. So as we sing this first song this morning, make it your prayer to Him. Change my heart, O oh God. Philippians 2, 
starting with verse 5. It says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, and being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So let's all join together now and glorify the King of Kings, who is the Great I Am. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the
Well, we're going to continue our sermon series on the, uh, in the book of James. We're going to be in chapter 5 today. I also wanted to mention to you, uh, I, I've, I've been asking around, and I'm, um, so far I'm getting some uh, a positive response to it, I think, but uh, I'm asking, would you be interested in me doing a series on the book of Revelation? I did that a number of years ago. It's been quite a number of years ago. We went through the book of Revelation. And uh, I think that uh, we get a lot of questions as pastors from uh, things in the book of Revelation. And uh, I think it would be good for us to go through the book and see if we can uh, clarify some things and uh, uh, maybe make some things more confusing. So that's kind of what the book of Revelation does. But I'm planning on uh, kind of thinking about that because I'm getting good positive response. I can see from your nods out there that there's a lot of you that would like to see that. Uh, probably after Easter, we'll start that series. So that can be something we can all be looking forward to. So James chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Let's read together, shall we? Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which cry out, which you kept back by fraud are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now, I wanted to, uh, before we go on, I'm going to back up a little bit there's a verse I want us to look at. The last line of that verse, you have laid up treasure in the last days. Are we living in the last days? You hear people say that all the time, but we've got to be in the last days. There's even books called The, the Last Days, and we're in the last days. And you hear sermons and preachers saying, we've got to be in the last days. Well, the fact of the matter is, we have been in the last days since Jesus went back to heaven. You see, we need to understand that God doesn't look at time the way we look at time. To him, a day is as a thousand years. He doesn't, he's not a timekeeper like we are. And so, when we say the last days, for God, that, that's His timing. The last days, it'll come when it'll culminate when Jesus comes back again. And so, we see in the New Testament, they were always talking about the last days. They were talking about this being the last days. And, in fact, in Peter... He, ad he addresses it by saying people are going around saying, well, where is this sign of his coming? It, 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 you know, it days come and days go and he's not here. So, so what's the deal? He said he's going to come, he's not coming. Well, they're saying that today. You can say that today. Look, here we are all these years, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years from the time when, when the promises were made and he still hasn't come. So we can say, well, you know, that's just... It's probably not coming. Well, that's not so, because we need to understand that we are in the last days. We have been in the last days since Jesus went to heaven. And the point is, for all of us, is that we are to be ready 
We are to be watching. We are to be waiting for Christ to come. And all through history, there have been those who have, who have, who have looked at the circumstances that's going on in the world and have said, it's got to be it. This has got to be it. He's got to be coming soon. And we can imagine what it was like during World War II, World War I. Of course people were looking for Christ to come. It's been that way all through history. And we're looking for Christ to come today. That's what he wants us to do, to, to be looking. But he has his timetable, and he knows when the time is right. Now, a lot of things about today makes you kind of wonder, or may, may, makes you really think that we really need to be looking because we, we have never seen, and the Bible talks about knowledge increasing, we have never seen a time in history when knowledge has increased so rapidly as it has in the last few years. We could start in 1900, but I'm talking about even the last three or four years. The, the, the strides that mankind is making in science and, and things is just phenomenal. It's, it is increasing exponentially. I think in this age of, in this, in this decade of, the, of, the, of uh, 2020, we're going to see some major breakthroughs take place in the field of medicine and so forth, and certainly in space and, and science. I, so I was reading a deal, and uh, I like to look at, go to the NASA website and look at the things that they're doing, the experiments that they're, they're experimenting with. They're, they're talking about putting uh, up in space, they're talking about putting solar panels that will that the sun, of course, will will uh, reach. And it has, doesn't have to go through our atmosphere, but be so much more efficient because it doesn't have to go through our atmosphere. And then from those solar panels, uh, sending a signal, an electromagnetic signal, down to antennas down here that will convert that signal into DC energy, DC current. And uh, I mean that. The, you think about that. Think about the potential of that. If that can be generated that way, and we don't have to have big fans all over the countryside and, and so forth. But it's just, it's, it's awesome the way things are progressing, and yet, as the Bible predict, predicts, at the same time, the moral character of our world is tanking, is going down, 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 down. And no matter how much we like to think that there are some scribes, you know, maybe against that, we go a little bit forward, but then they go two steps backwards. The moral degradation of our society and our world is at an all-time low end. I don't anticipate it's going to get any better. The signs, I really think, are there. And you just wonder how long, this is worldwide, you just wonder how long God's timetable is going to work. The point is, we need to recognize that we are in the last days and have been in the last days and we need to be ready at all times. Just wanted to point that little thing out about that, about that uh, statement about the last days. So, in the uh, culture in which James was writing, and he mentions, in, he mentions the wealthy. In this passage of scripture, he doesn't start by saying in this section, uh, come now, brothers. In other words, he doesn't, in other places he says, come now brothers, talking to the Christian people. You know, we, we mentioned that James has written to uh, the uh, Jewish Christians, Hebrew Christians. And so he, at, periodically he says in the book, now come now brothers and sisters. You know, come now brothers, listen to what I have to say. Here, he doesn't say that. He says, come now you rich. So he's not really talking I don't think to Christians here, but perhaps using this as, a, as an example to tell Christians to what to watch out for. There were three things in that society that were uh, considered to be signs of being rich. There was clothing, there was grain, and there was gold and silver. Those three things were the signs that someone was rich. And in the in the Message Bible, uh, he says, it says, it words it this way. And a final word to you, arrogant rich. Take some lessons in lament. 
You'll need buckets for the tears when the crash comes upon you. Your money is corrupt and your fine clothing stinks. Your greedy luxuries are a cancer in your gut, destroying your life from within. You thought you were piling up wealth. What you piled up is judgment. So he talks about the garments. They had so many of these beautiful garments and clothing hanging in the closet. There were so many of them, they didn't even ever get to them to wear them, and they were being mothy. They were being, you know, eaten away by moths. It hasn't changed that much, really, has it, in our, in our society? Uh, maybe I'm just a pretty naive person, I don't know, but, but I, I know that there are people in this world who really do think they're pretty hot stuff. There are people in this world who believe they are better than everybody else. I believe there are people in government that have that attitude. I believe it's the reason why the Holocaust took place. Because Hitler convinced the people that they were a superior race and the Jews were inferior. We've had the same issue in our country with, uh, with the black people in the early days of our country. They actually were thought of to be inferior human beings. You see it in, in society all around. Uh, Jan and I like to watch, I mentioned this before, we like to watch British uh, uh, like crime sh shows and things, and, and uh, I like Perot, Agatha Christie's Perot. David Suchet plays him just tremendously, just love, I love watching that. But I was watching one the other day, and it was uh, it was the death of 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 Lord Edgewood, or something like that. But anyway, this guy Edgewood was an elitist. He treated everybody like they were dirt, and uh, he ended up being murdered, which was usually the 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 you know the. Uh, crankiest and hardest to get along with person is the guy that gets murdered in these movies, you know, and it's always like, well, he deserved it, you know. <laughs> but he ended up being murdered. But before he was murdered, one of the things that he did was he was in his office, in his home, his big, beautiful office, and his secretary, this lady who was his secretary, came in and brought him some papers. It was late at night, and, and uh, he said, he, he said, here's your paper, sir, or Lord Edgewood, Okay, well, thanks. And, and she said, can I get you a drink? And he says, what? She says, uh, can I get you a drink? He said, you think I want a drink with you? He said, you forgetting your station. I think you better be fired. I mean, that kind of arrogance. There are actually people in the world that, that think that way. And that's what he's talking about here. These, the, this kind of people he's talking about in this passage of Scripture, they're arrogant. They're rich. They've got all this wonderful clothing, and he's saying that it's just going to rot away. Even your gold and silver is going to corrode. Your grain that you've got all piled up and everything, it's just going to be ruined, turned to nothing. He goes on to say, all the workers you've exploited and cheated cry out for judgment. The groans of the workers you used and abused are a roar in the ears of the master avenger. You've looted the earth and lived it up, but all you have to show for it is a fatter than usual corpse. <laughs> I like that. All you've got to show for it is a fatter than usual corpse. In fact, what you've done is condemn and murder perfectly good people who stand there and take it. So he just kind of, in his writing to the, these, these Jewish Christians, he kind of searched this thing, and there must have, been a, must have been something that was a pet peeve to him or something, where he had, uh, you know, what the rich were doing uh, to the world, and how they were living it up, and, and they were abusing other people. So he tells them, 
your judgment is going to be great. Then he turns to the Christian people he's writing to, and he says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. Is that what, is that what you farmers do? <laughs> Wait patiently? <laughs> yeah, well, you don't have much choice, really, do you? You've got to wait, and you've got to let the rains and all do its job in order for them to, for the crops to grow. You also be patient. He uses this as an example. He says, you also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. There it is. Here we were back this many years ago. And James is telling them the coming of the Lord is at hand. And I can say to you today, the coming of the Lord is at hand. We always need to be ready and watching for the Lord to come. For He is going to come. And then He said, don't grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Remember last Sunday, the topic was, part of it was talking, was talking about judging People And I gave you the little illustration, which I've gotten a lot of feedback from. People uh, seem to really uh, hit a note, which I'm glad, which is, that's why I do illustrations, is that we're the sheep, and God is the shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd there, and He is the judge, the Bible tells us. He is the ultimate judge. But when we judge our brother and sister, then we just kind of pop up there with Him on the throne and put ourselves in a position of, being the judge. And James is saying, don't do that. And then talking about suffering, he says, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. Many of the prophets, if you read the prophets, and we won't go into a study of those right now, but the prophets had had a lot of patience. They had to wait a long time for the Lord's uh, work <clears throat> to be revealed. <clears throat> they had to be steadfast. And then he specifically refers to Job. And have you seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful? You do know the story of the book of Job, right? As Christians, I had a, a gentleman years ago that uh, was going through some real difficult times physically. It seemed like one thing after another was happening to him and he was in the hospital. And this is a man who was raised in the church. He was raised in the church all of his life. And I went to see him and I said to him, first thing I said to him, you must feel like Job. And he said, who? And I thought, oh, okay. You don't know who Job is, all right, well, <clears throat> Job was the, the one that, that Satan tried. The whole book is, the point of the book is to show how we need to be faithful in suffering. But he had everything taken away from him. Satan destroyed his family, his crops, his, and, and, and made him, he was sick. He was sitting on an ash heap with, with uh, sores all over his body. And he had all uh, these these friends, these three friends, so-called, uh, which were also have also been considered tormentors, because they came and they kept pointing to him, to his sin, saying, "You, you had to do something wrong. You had to do something wrong against God, or you, this wouldn't be happening to you. It's got to be your fault. There's something wrong with you." God had already said that this man was a righteous man. And Job searched his heart, and I can't. I don't know. I can't think of anything that I have done to offend God. I love God. He's my, he's my Lord. And they kept accusing him and accusing him all through the book. And even his wife said, why don't you just, why don't you just curse God and die? Give it up. And Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. <coughs> though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Of course, the book ends with God restoring 
everything to Job and then some, much more than he even had before, because Job was steadfast and he was faithful to God, even in the midst of the most severe suffering. And that's what we are called upon to do. That's, that is what, that is what uh, uh, James is pointing out here, that we need to be steadfast in the face of suffering because when it all said and done, even though he's slain me, even though it leads us to, to death, that can only mean something great and wonderful for us because we will enter into the joys of heaven. He says, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Now Jesus taught something very similar in uh, the fifth chapter of uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. He said, and don't say anything you don't mean. I don't want to read it out of that translation. I want to go back to EIB. He said, again, you've heard that it said, uh, of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven or by the, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your yes be simply yes, and your no, no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Your yes be yes and your no be no. What James is talking about here is being honest. You remember, I'm sure that you've had conversations with, with individuals about a contract or something like that and, and you've probably reminisced back to the day when Two farmers would agree on something and they would do a handshake and then that was it. And they both lived by it. Their yes was yes and their no was no. They were honest. They had integrity. Nowadays, you have to have reams and reams of paper from the lawyers that everybody's got to sign and have witnesses to and so forth. Because we don't trust our yes to be yes and our no to be no. James is saying, be honest. Jesus is saying, be honest. You don't have to swear by anything because that will bring, that can bring condemnation. How can it bring condemnation? Because if you swear by something and then you don't live up to it, then, you know, you're condemned. Be honest. If you say you're going to pray for somebody, pray for them. Don't just say it. Don't just let words be said. I'm going to pray. I'll pray for you and then forget about it. That's a small thing, I know, but that type of relationship where we, where we love one another and we are respectful of one another and we are honest in everything that we do. It says, let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you will not fall into condemnation. Now there's been, there's some people who uh, use these scriptures to say that they have a religious conviction about not swearing in in court, placing their hand on the Bible and saying that they will speak the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help them God. And uh, I think this, that's a misapplication of Scripture. There's a difference even back in Moses' day in the legal system, they would swear in uh, for the truth of what they were saying. And I believe in the court of law, that's, that's perfectly acceptable. That's not what this is talking about. I believe this is talking about being honest and truthful, mean what you say, and don't make promises 
that you don't intend to keep or that you can't keep. Just be honest. But above all, brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes, your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Father, we thank you today for the teaching of your word and how we are guided and instructed because of, of uh, the words that you have inspired writers to share with us, like this one from James. Father, we want to learn the lesson from the rich. We want our lives to be rich in love and mercy and filled with the goodness of Jesus Christ. We want our lives to be honest before you. And Father, we want to be looking and expecting your return at any time. Help us to be faithful and not become lax in our understanding that when the time is right, according to your timetable, it will happen, and we need to be ready. We thank you, Father, today for blessing us with this wonderful word from James. In his name we pray, amen. I want to sing this song of love and adoration to Jesus as we close our service today. Oh, how I love Jesus. Can you say that? Say that with me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Let's stand up and sing it together. 